Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Gilliland. I've been studying people's needs in labor for over 20 years. I'm a birth doula researcher. I'm a birth doula trainer for over 20 years. I've been a doula, went to my first birth when I was in my early 20s. I'm now close to 60. I'm a mother. I'm also a research associate at the Center for Child and Family Wellbeing. And I'm here to talk to you today about if you have to labor by yourself without your loved ones around you, okay? I have also had that kind of a labor, and I think that's one of the reasons why it spoke to me so much. Most of the time I'm educating uh, doulas, nurses, and physicians. I don't normally talk directly to parents, but I felt that I had specialized knowledge that I really wanted to pass on to you during this special time. And so that's why I've made this video. And I've also made an eight page PDF document that's full of messages, um, directly addresses your questions, and also has <clears throat> over 20 different action items that you can take in order to help yourself prepare for that situation. And you can get that a PDF here at amygilliland.net. So I just want to reiterate that right away from the beginning that everything that I'm going to tell you is written down. And so you can get that. I'm also the author of the book, The Heart of the Doula, which is a research book about best practices done on my research with doulas. I'm also have been, um, I also have chapters that I've contributed in all of these books as well as information in Deborah Pascali Bonaro's new Sex After Baby book. So you might not know me, but you probably have read or been touched by something that I've done. Um, right now here today, I want to address your concerns and your feelings because I'm sure you're feeling anxious uncertain, scared, and probably angry. You're concerned about power and control in the hospital. You're concerned about um, what it's going to be like, what's going to be different, what's going to be the same um, when you get to the hospital. You're also concerned about your own ability to cope with labor, all right? So what I'm going to cover in this video is I'm going to cover the fact that you can still have a good enough birth. Yes, you can. You can have a good enough birth at this time. Your nursing care may actually be better. The best way to write a birth plan um, during this pandemic and communicate your needs when you don't have other people there for you in order to help you do that. What you can expect in the hospital. Um, if you're a member of a marginalized group, how to help communicate your needs uh, more effectively to the nursing support team. Um, and the number one way to prepare. Okay, so I'm going to start with that. The number one best way to prepare in order to labor in the hospital without your loved ones close by is to believe in yourself. You number one have to believe in yourself, in your body, and your body's ability to birth this baby. That is the most important thing. Once you believe in yourself, once you believe in your body, your body grew this baby, your body has nourished this baby, and your brain knows how to get that baby out. Once you enter into that, once you've crossed over into that area of belief, yes, my body can do this, we have an entirely different scenario unfolding in front of us. So that is your number one job, okay? If you're the kind of person who can get into your labor, who can allow um, the, your limbic system and those oxytocin hormones to just take over and to just be in the midst of that labor and allowing it to do what it needs to do in all of its power, that's amazing and wonderful. That uh, What you're doing is you're leaving your cerebral cortex, your decision-making rational part of your brain, and you're going deep into your limbic system. That's what's required for labor. In order to allow that oxytocin to flow, however, you need to feel safe. That's the number one thing is you have to feel safe. So if you can enter into that environment at some point in labor in the hospital, feel safe and that you believe in your body and your ability to birth this baby, you can do that. If you're listening to me and you're saying, whoa, Amy, I can't really relinquish control like that. There's no way. I don't want to like go into labor land very much. It's like I want to stay in my cerebral cortex. I want to keep track of what's happening to me. That's really, really important. It's like, and or I want pain medication and I know I want pain medication. It's like, so all of those things when you have an epidural, you stay in your cerebral cortex. And what I want to tell you is, you know yourself and that's fabulous. 
and you know your own needs and you know your own wants. And that's an excellent, excellent place to start, okay? And that's more important. You're still gonna be able to have your baby. You're still gonna have a good enough labor. You're still gonna allow those labor hormones to flow because epidurals work. They give pain relief, okay? As well as allowing labor to continue, all right? So we're gonna get to how to best work with that labor in my third point. The first thing I'm gonna talk about right now is what people's number one concern is, all right? What are issues about power and control in the hospital? When I'm talking about power and control in the hospital, people are usually wondering about, what are my options? Are my options going to be limited? Um, are they going to make me do things that I don't want to do? Am I more likely to have Pitocin or a cesarean or some other intervention simply because of what's happening? I wish that I could tell you that you wouldn't experience that. But that's not what uh, people who are birthing without their loved ones are telling us, and that's not what hospitals are publishing in terms of their rules. So hospital systems are always at odds with birthing people. The system is not set up to empower you. I wish that I could tell you that it was, and I wish that I could be less direct about this. But the situation is forcing my hand, okay? Most hospital systems are set up to continue to do what they do, not to individualize care, however. Um, however, we're also finding in the midst of this pandemic that, um, <clears throat> that nurses are, and midwives are really responding um, to make sure that people still have options in their facilities. Both of their organizations, ACNM and A1, have gone on record as saying that we want pregnant people to still have doulas available, peanut balls available, birthing balls available. We want them to be able to labor in water. We want them to have squatting bars. We want them to be able to birth in water if that's what the policy has been at the hospital. Unfortunately, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists has come, up, uh, has come out against all of those things that empower people in labor or enable them to do other things besides just labor in bed, okay? So it's unfortunate that ACOG has done that. Um, they are very interested in medical outcomes. They're not very interested in other outcomes, such as mental health outcomes, birth satisfaction outcomes, um, breastfeeding outcomes, uh, satisfaction with your marriage or whatever, any of those other outcomes they're not interested in. And so that immediately puts them at odds. So you're entering into this situation. Um, and you know what? What I want you to know is it's always like that, okay? It's not any different. So what I want you to recognize is the fact that you, you should call ahead to your hospital. So what are your action items? Call ahead to your hospital, find out what the limits are, and if, uh, if the, you are limited in terms of what kind of equipment you can bring with you, okay? So that would be important. Second, um, uh, so I'm going to suggest that if you're not allowed to have peanut balls, that you bring your own, okay? Peanut balls are wonderful, and if you have your own, um, and I go through in the PDF how you can sterilize it and store it to maximize the chances that you'll be able to bring it in with you. Okay, you can hug your peanut ball whenever you need to give anybody a hug or you need to feel hugged. This feels really good. You can put it down on any counter or table, all right, and then you can lean over it like you would on a round ball. You can see that it has, uh, here in the middle, it has a dip. So if you sit on it, your pelvis is quite likely to be lower than your knees, which puts you in a modified squatting position. It's also really nice for rocking and rolling on, and people tend to feel that it's more stable than it is uh, on a round ball. But here's the number one reason you want to bring your own peanut ball is for second stage, okay? Uh, in second stage, you want to use the tuck position, which means that you're holding on to the ball here, and then you're going to bring your knees up to the bottom of the ball here, and you're gonna tuck the ball between your knees, okay? And when you're laying on your side, that enables all the healthcare people to be able to see your perineum and everything that they wanna see, because the ball's not in the way. It means that the birth canal is a straight passage, so it means that your pelvis is straight, your vaginal canal is straight, so the baby can come right through, which is why when you use a peanut ball, labors are more efficient and they're shorter. Um, it also protects your perineum from injury. It's your, if you are in the semi-sitting position, which is when you're sitting on your butt 
with your knees pulled back like this, okay? What happens is that the baby then has to go down into the birth canal and then up around the pubic bone in order to get born. It's no longer a straight shot, it's an S-curve. You're also more likely to have a pudendal nerve injury, you're more likely to tear, and you're more likely to have a perineal injury, all right? I wanna spare you from all of those things. So if you're using a peanut ball inside lying and your care provider says, all right, we want you to move into semi-sitting, uh, this is where we're moving into your fourth action item. No is a complete sentence. No, I'm not moving. No, I don't think I want Pitocin. You're in labor. You don't have to give anything else but no. You don't have to give lengthy explanations, okay? No, I don't think that's what I want to do right now, okay? No is a complete sentence. <laughs> So um, I'm not telling you to say not to move, but I am telling you that it is okay for you to say that you're not going to move. Care providers can catch babies in sideline position, and it's much better for your bottom and for your recovery um, than being in semi-sitting. This is something that physicians don't know. It's something that nurses know, it's something that midwives know, and it's something that doulas know, okay? so. Um, that's the uh, so those are my four action items there. So bring your own peanut ball. Uh, no is a complete sentence. I want you to recognize that this conflict always exists, and then I want you to let go of it. And what I want you to concentrate on is I want you to concentrate on loving your baby, and the connection that you have with your baby. All right, I want you to just concentrate on that, and that the two of you are going into this situation together. And there's going to be unexpected good things too, all right? And we're going to get to that in the next 30 seconds, what the unexpected good things are, all right? So, part two. What can I expect in the hospital? The nurses are actually less busy, okay? They've, uh, most hospitals, almost all hospitals have canceled elective inductions. So any kind of induction, unless it's for a medical reason, isn't happening. Um, that means their cesarean census is down because one quarter of all inductions end in the cesarean, simply because that's the nature of induction statistically that happens. They aren't doing any elective um, cesareans right now. And when people are coming in in labor, they're coming in in active labor with labor well established rather than in early labor like people would typically do so. Um, the other thing that they're finding is that since they're releasing people 24 hours postpartum to send them home, that there's, um, the nurses don't have as many people to take care of. So they are able to offer you one-on-one -on -one care. So you can expect to have, once you've, you're in active labor, you're having the traction three minutes apart, they're demanding a coping ritual from you, they've been doing this for a couple of hours, and they've been lasting a minute or over a minute, by that point, your nurse is going to be in your room alone with you. So you will get one-on-one -on -one nursing care, um, which is better than usual. It is the A1 standard, and many nurses are really, really excited that they don't have all this conflicting committee work and other things that they're supposed to do. All right. So what can you expect in the hospital? Once you arrive at the door, an escort or a nurse from labor and delivery unit will come down and get you, okay? It just depends on their infection rules. So then the escort or the nurse will take you up to the unit. If it's obvious you're in active labor, they're gonna take you directly into a labor and delivery room. If there's some uncertainty, they will take you into triage, but they don't wanna to have to disinfect triage again if they don't need to. So once I said, if you're in active labor, you'll be in your room and that's when you'll be assigned your labor and delivery nurse. Uh, you will not leave your room again until after your baby is born, okay? So um, your nurse will be with you until shift change. You should not have multiple examiners. You should only have the nurse and your physician, whoever's going to be responsible for catching the baby and doing the delivery. Those should be the only two people who are involved in your medical care or who are coming into your room, okay? Um, oh, once the baby is born, you'll be discharged within 24 hours and they'll be doing follow-up there. You can expect everyone to be gloved, gowned, um, with a mask on as well as a face shield, okay? That's what we're seeing if they suspect that you're positive. Um, you may, they may not be wearing the face shields, may only be wearing glasses 
and a mask, okay? Most nurses are requesting that and it's good for you for them to wear a mask. The problem is, is that you can feel really disconnected and detached. If you need to read lips like I do, um, you can't see them anymore and it's really hard to see people's facial expressions. So if you're feeling disconnected, one of your action items is to tell them, I'm feeling really disconnected from you because of all the equipment. And then maybe then they'll share with you a funny story or do some effort in order to connect with you since they can't, it's not happening automatically with their faces, okay? Um, so um, video chatting, all right? Most hospitals will allow you to video chat during first stage. During second stage, it sometimes becomes iffy um, because they don't want people to be recording the birth. Um, you may ask them, can I turn the phone towards the wall so they can just hear things? Sometimes that's acceptable, sometimes that's not. The other thing is, you're in labor. You, you may not be able to set up the Wi-Fi. You may not be able to set up the phone. You may not, the Wi-Fi may only work in one part of the room and that's not where you're laboring. So I don't want you to get hung up on the idea that you're always going to be able to have virtual support and be able to chat with your loved ones. It's wonderful if you can and that's what you want, but I don't want you to think that that's always going to be available, okay? Because I don't want that to be something that you have to get over when you get at the hospital. You may also find that you're so busy laboring that, that you just, you don't, want, you don't want that. People are often surprised by their own needs during labor and this is no exception, okay? So um, the other things that you can do is to write a simple birth plan. And one of the things that you want, there's several things that you want to communicate. You want to do your usual priorities, but you also need to communicate, what do I need for labor support? Because I'm arriving in labor, all right? You're not going to have time to have these lengthy um, conversations or communications with your nurse, especially if you're arriving in active labor, like ACOG suggests, all right? So... Um, yes, what is there? So, in a birth plan, I'm going raw, all right? I am not looking at the pretty paper, I'm not looking at that. I think that putting your birth plan right up there in your own handwriting with your own six, um, uh, your own six or eight priorities is the best way to go, okay? And it's all right, I say, say the things that you need. Call me by my name, all right? That's important to me. Um, involve me in all decisions about my care. Don't offer pain medication. Be kind and patient with me, all right? I kind of distilled that down was when it comes to respect or whatever. No, if, if you're being kind to me, you're being compassionate, you're being caring, you're being patient. That's my bottom line. And I don't see any problem with putting something like that on here. I don't want to assume anybody's going to treat me any particular way, especially in this land of implicit bias, all right? So hold my baby right away, delay cord clamping, no suctioning, because that's what I wanted. Birth in side lying with a peanut ball, okay? Skin to skin for 90 minutes. Now... If you have special needs, if you're the, if you have a disability, if you're homeless, if you're a member of the marginalized group, if you have a complex medical record and you're afraid of people judging you, the paper has to speak for you. Don't let the system shame you into being silent about your needs. If you are a trauma survivor, if you are a rape survivor, you are not allowed to bring in your special people with you, okay? That means that the onus is on them to meet your needs. And it's on you to communicate what those are, all right? So call them up on the phone and say, hi, I'm a trauma survivor, I'm in labor, I need a nurse who's used to dealing with this, okay? Who's used to dealing with people like me, who can give me the extra patience that I need today, okay? So you're gonna do that once you're in labor, a few hours before you expect to go in. Call them in and say, this is what I need. Also, I don't have any problem, once again, putting it on a piece of paper because this has to advocate for you. Don't judge me based on my medical record. I have a mental health issue and I am a good parent. Whatever it is that you are afraid of being judged about, you can turn that into a positive. You can let people know this is the kind of care I need from you.
Listen to me. I deserve to be involved in decisions about my care, okay? If you're part of a marginalized group and you're used to receiving implicit bias or people not doing this for you, in labor you can't speak for yourself. You don't have your buddies to do that. So this is our hope. You can say it if you want to develop a rapport, but if you don't, just put it in a piece of tape on the bed, on the wall behind your bed, okay? The other thing you want to let people know in the hospital is how they can help you with labor support. Helpful things to say or do, all right? Amy, your body knows just what to do. You and your baby are doing this together. You are surrounded by love. You can do this. We're here to help you. Let us help you more. Wouldn't you want to hear that from your nurse? I would. That's what I was thinking. What messages would I want to get from them? And it's different than you expected, but it can still be wonderful. And that's what I want you to know, all right? It can still be wonderful. All right? And that brings us really into part number three. Laboring on your own in the hospital. So you're not going to be laboring alone because you're going to have a labor and delivery nurse there with you, all right? So, um, so you won't be alone, but it's a matter of developing a rapport with that person and finding the best, um, there we go, okay, my pages got stuck together, so I want to look at this, all right? And when you think about laboring alone, okay, or laboring without your loved ones, the question that comes to me is what is it essential? What is your focus? What do you really, really essentially need during labor? And can you provide those things easily for yourself or to have them close by you? Now, number one, I said, is a belief in your body and its ability to give birth, all right? Your brain knows how to get that baby out. It knows, and if you listen to it, so that's number one, believe in your body. Number two is, is to be instinctual and listen to the messages your body is giving you, all right? A lot of times in labor, women will say, oh, I just want, I just want to lift up on my belly. I just want to lift up on my belly and do a, do a pelvic tilt. Oh, that feels so good. It feels so good. Well, that also helps the baby to move under the brim of the pelvis. Other times I'm with someone in later in labor and I see them doing this and they're lifting up their leg and they're lifting up their leg and I'm thinking, ah, I want to get a stool to put under there. Yep, because the body knows that, geez, if we lift up the leg on that one side, that's going to help the baby to rotate right into where we want it to go. Okay, your brain knows that. So number two is listen to your body and the messages that it's giving to you in order to help you, in order to get into good positions now and during labor, all right? Number three, develop a coping ritual for labor that's soothing to you and that doesn't rely on anybody else, okay? Now, as a doula trainer, um, a lot of times when I'm talking about coping rituals, I'm involving people, hand-holding, eye contact, things like that. We don't know if that's going to be available to you. Also, if you're following ACOG guidelines, they don't want you in the hospital till you're at six centimeters or more. Okay, they this they came out with this about five years ago, but people just have still been going in, in early labor anyway. ACOG says we want you there when you're six centimeters, which would be uh, active labor would be well established. Your contractions would be coming every three minutes or so for about two hours and lasting at least a minute. Okay, so and that would be for a first timer. For a second timer, it might be a little bit more rapid. All right, but those heavy, strong contractions that are taking all of your attention, they really don't want you in the hospital until you get there. So it's perfectly okay. You're following obstetric guidelines to stay home until that time. So how can you do that? You're also gonna to have to transfer whatever you're doing to cope with at home when you get to the hospital. So a coping ritual. I think things that involve movement, okay, things that involve something that you're looking at or picturing in your mind, and also something that you're saying, all right, as such as a chant, I can do it, I can do it. And if you're moving your hands together, whatever your rhythm is, okay, something that you can do that whether you're lying down, all right, whether you're being driven in the car, 
whether you're walking around, having a cervical exam done, all of those things. You want to be able to do your coping ritual. So things that involve your arms and upper body are better than things that involve your leg or gross motor, motor movements, right? So um, practice labor coping by yourself. So number three, so this is number four. So practice labor coping by yourself. Practice your relaxation and your breathing, perhaps to music, perhaps to a scent that you like, but you want to behaviorally condition yourself to relax to certain stimuli. All of this has gone over in detail in the PDF and comfort measures are done, are gone over really well in any kind of online childbirth class you're gonna take. Um, the Gentle Birth app by my colleague Tracy Donegan um, has uh, visualizations on it, it has music, and you can put it on your smartphone and take it with you. So that's one of the few apps that I know of that's really, really helpful in this situation for labor coping. Um, now then the question becomes, when should I go to the hospital? Uh, my default is if you ever feel you're, you're the person in labor, you wanna go to the hospital, you go. Because your brain knows. If your brain says, we should go to the hospital, you should go, all right? Because it knows whether something is happening down here that's requiring medical care, all right? Now, if that's not the case, the thing is, is you're like, well, how do I know how far along I am? I'm going to tell you a secret. You can check your own cervix. Yes, you can. You can check your own cervix using your own fingers inside your own body. Mm -hmm. It doesn't belong to anybody else but you. And if you start now in late pregnancy, you get real familiar with your cervix. Uh, once your mucus plug falls out, that means you're starting to dilate. So you'll be able to feel that soft center start to open. You'll be able to feel your cervix get thinner, okay, which is called effacement. And remember, you're not determining, you know, seven or eight centimeters when there's just a little bit of cervix left. What you're thinking about is, well, how far along am I in now? You can check your own cervix. It's not rocket science. If you don't want to do it, teach somebody else who's familiar with your genitals and they could do it for you if you would prefer, okay? But this isn't medical stuff. This is your body and you can figure this out on your own. You really can, all right? So I want to give you back that power. Now, if you need to be monitored, if you have a medical condition, if you have high blood pressure, if you're quite anxious about laboring outside of the hospital, then you should of course go early. Establish that rapport and that relationship with your nurse and try to connect with them through conversation, all right? And sharing of stories and being vulnerable with one another, all right? Um, the seventh way you wanna prepare <clears throat> is you want to make sure that you're familiar with all the decisions that you're going to have to make about your child's care when you're there and that you have an answer for them about eye drops, about vitamin K shots, okay? So it's far too early to do um, uh, any kind of surgery, so you would need to wait um, and do that because they're not going to do that in the first 24 hours. You probably have to do follow-up visits for some of the um, uh, immunizations too. But any other kind of decisions you want to be prepared. Also, if you find out that you've been exposed, you're going to want to make a decision about whether you want to keep your baby with you or whether you're going to want to isolate for two weeks. That's going to be on the table in front of you as well. So if you have more time, I really want to suggest that you take an online childbirth education class, one that's taught by somebody local to you, because they're going to know what your options are in the area and even different physicians and how they're doing things differently or the same as they did before, okay? So there's no excuse these days because almost all birth educators have had to go online with their regular courses. So it shouldn't be hard for you to find one. If you have more time than just a few weeks, you might want to consider taking a hypnobirthing class. Um, I know of an instructor in my area, Connie Lambeth, who's been doing an online hypnobirthing class for um, quite a while now that's very successful. Um, you And there's several different options there. So um, self-hypnosis, also mindfulness. Mindfulness birth classes are starting to pop up around the country. And once again, that helps you to deal with your anxiety as well as developing long-term parenting skills. Both of those things would be helpful, all right? So, what are my final thoughts? All right, so what are my final thoughts here? 
in any hospital birth, there's going to be conflict between what you want and what the staff wants to do, okay? That's just the way the nature of the beast, and this isn't any different. Um, so that hasn't changed. Your options may be limited in terms of labor coping, uh, squatting bars and things like that, but on the positive side, you're gonna get one-on-one -on -one care from an experienced labor and delivery nurse who does not have other people to take care of, all right? Because they can't do that. And once I said, if you're in earlier labor, yes, they may be there intermittently, you're more likely to be there on your own. Um, however, once active labor really gets going, you're gonna get one-on-one -on -one care, all right? And that's excellent because you have the opportunity to create a connection and a relationship with that nurse. You're gonna remember her. 99% of all labor and delivery nurses refer to themselves as her or she, and you're going to remember her for the rest of your life until the day you leave. You're going to remember this person, all right? So it's a relationship that's worth investing in because of that, to create connection. Um, there's so much you don't know. There's so much risk involved. Birth is risky. Life is is risky. Life is all about making choices about, do I want to take this risk or not? Which one? Which one is most acceptable? This may be one of the first times in your life when you're making major decisions. They're going to have lifelong outcomes. And that's what birth does. That's the nature of the experience. But I can guarantee something. You will discover you have strengths and capabilities that you did not know you had because that is the nature of birth. It is there to be transformative and to show you parts of yourself that you have not experienced before. It's a part of the mystery. It's a part of the transformation of birth that it offers to everybody. And it's there for you. And that hasn't gone away and that hasn't changed.